The Tom Woods Show, episode 1601. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody, make it your New Year's resolution to stop going to the post office. Stamps.com brings all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your computer. And with my promo code WOODS, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in WOODS. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here. Really delighted to have an opportunity to talk to Ryan Levesque. And by the way, if you look at his last name, there's an S in there, but it's silent. So I don't want you to think, oh, Woods here doesn't know how to pronounce the guy's name. Yes, I do, doggone it. It's just a weird pronunciation. But anyway, I got it wrong before, so I'm not going to make that mistake again. But uh, some of you know Ryan uh, because a good number of you have actually read his book from 2015 called Ask. has probably the longest subtitle of any book written in the 21st century. <laughs> the subtitle is The Counterintuitive Online Formula to Discover Exactly what your customers want to buy, create a mass of raving fans, and take any business to the next level. And what's interesting about that book, of course, is that it's summing up exactly what it is that entrepreneurs are supposed to do, right? I mean, what is the market economy about? It's about satisfying consumer preferences. You put it that simply, you think, okay, well, that seems pretty easy, just satisfy consumer preferences. But that's easier said than done, because what the heck are consumer preferences? What do these people want, for heaven's sake? And Ryan came up with this formula that you basically ask them. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but this is very much the opposite of what the way a lot of businessmen want to act, and I'm going to talk about that. So he's kind of showing how we get from the theory of the market economy to the actual nuts and bolts of how you implement that. How do you satisfy consumer demand? How do you figure out what it is? Well, since then, he has a much more recent book called Choose, and the subtitle here is a bit more manageable, the single most important decision before starting your business. Ryan has sold hundreds of thousands of copies. And when I read Ask, I was a little late to the party. I actually just read it a few weeks ago. It was extremely eye-opening for me as well. So it was a great opportunity, and I'm really delighted to be able to talk to Ryan. Uh, welcome to the show, Ryan. Tom, it's great to be here. Look, I read your book, Ask. I know we're going to be talking about your book, Choose. I got to know you because basically I saw Ask being promoted by Almost everybody I knew, everybody had read it. So I finally got around to reading it. A lot of times with books like this, I don't know if you're like me, but I find that books like this are full of fluff and advice that sounds like it's out of a fortune cookie. I want specific, actionable things that are going to help me. You know, So I find these business books tend to be full of that. And that's not the case in uh, with your book. So I've appreciated that a lot. And I also liked your personal story because, man, have you been through the ringer. And then finally, when Ben Settle, who is my marketing mentor, who has, his teaching has made my life a lot more comfortable. I'll just put it that way. When he recommended you, I thought, all right, well, then that just confirms my instincts that this is, this is a good guy. My people should, should hear about him. So I do want to start with some personal notes because I, I read, I've listened to you be interviewed. I've read your story in your book. I, I know about the, the Scrabble jewelry and all that. But I'm, I'm interested in what you were doing, let's say, leading up to the financial crisis of 2008. You had a nice little business that you'd been scaling, you know, 1000 a month, 2000 a month, 3000 a month, and then the bottom fell out from underneath it. Can you start the story there? Yeah, you know, so first of all, it's great to be here. And, uh, and thanks for those uh, kind words about the book. I'm the same way. Uh, anytime that I decide if I'm going to listen to somebody or uh, pay attention to anybody, I want to make sure that there's some substance beneath the surface, that it's not just sizzle, there's some steak there as well. So uh, it was very intentional in um, in both books and really everything that we do to, to really put some real meat, some real actionable step-by-step -step information. And that's one of the things that I really want to hope we get into here today to leave um, all your listeners with is some real kind of tactical steps uh, that they can put into action. So um, if we go back to 2008, I was actually working in the finance industry. I was at the time living and working in Shanghai, China for the insurance company AIG. And my world came crumbling down when I literally walked into my office one day, picked up the Wall Street Journal Asia edition and the headline read AIG to file for bankruptcy. Literally, the company that I was working for, that's how I found out that the company I was working for before the government bailout came in was about to go under. 
And it was at that time that I was talking with my wife about starting my own business. I wanted to take control of my own destiny. I never wanted to be on my hands and knees begging my raise for a boss. I wanted to be in control of my own financial destiny. And I took this as a sign. And I called up my wife, uh, who was in grad school at the time, and I said, honey, um, I think this is the sign I've been looking for. And literally that day, I turned in my resignation letter to my boss. And two weeks later, I had donated everything that I owned to charity, except for two suitcases worth of stuff, moved back into student housing. My wife was getting a, a, her PhD at HKU at Hong Kong University, moved back into student housing, and we started our first business. And that first business, as you alluded to, was in the strangest of markets. It was a market teaching people how to make Scrabble tile jewelry, which was a market that my wife found and stumbled upon and turned me on to. And that was the the first little business that we got going. But then even that business, it, it, that's when I heard about it, it seemed to me like a fairly evergreen kind of business. Maybe that's something people will always want to have. And it turns out it was just kind of a fad business. So then suddenly the, the, the bottom fell out from that and then you had to decide what the next step was. Gosh, you know, I wish I could say it was start the business and then we became multimillionaires and lived happily ever after. But the reality was this, I quit my job I cashed out of my retirement plan, um, moved to the single most expensive city in the entire world, Hong Kong. My wife was getting about a $500 a month uh, stipend as a uh, grad student. And um, we started this little business and we came across this market. We're making $1,000 a month, $2,000 a month, $3,000 a month. And I thought, oh my gosh, we're going to get rich. Like, this is incredible, right? Like, this, this is great. And um, literally one month, we had gotten our business up to making $8,000 a month. And I thought, gosh, uh, this is everything I touch turns to gold. And literally the next month, our business dried up to almost nothing. And it was that moment that I learned an important and valuable lesson. And that is the importance of not going into a fad market, going into what we describe as an evergreen market. What I learned is this whole Scrabble tile jewelry craze, which is really just teaching people how to make a specific type of jewelry that uses Scrabble tiles, origami paper, resin that you make into pendants and cufflinks and bracelets and things like that um, was just a fad. It was like Beanie Babies or Pogs or any of these things that, you know, Pokemon Go, these crazes that just take over the world and then dry up in next to nothing. But at this point, Tom, I'd quit my job. I had no income coming in. We basically had burned through our savings. And my wife and I had this moment where we looked at each other and we said, crap, <laughs> what do we do now? And so my wife finished up grad school. We moved back to the U.S. Once again, uh, sold and donated everything that we owned except for two suitcases each. And in our late 20s, we started over. We started over and my wife, uh, her uh, degree is in history um, and she got a job as a museum curator at the Brownsville, Texas Historical Association, which is, um, uh, Brownsville is a border town in Texas. It's historically very important with the trade between Mexico and the United States, but it's also the poorest zip code in the contiguous United States. And so we moved to an apartment, bars on the windows, uh, mattress on the floor, uh, no cable, $50 a week grocery budget, budget, and we started over. And my wife was making about, I think, $36,000 a year. And I would drive her to work back and forth each day. And um, we started our next business. And this time I learned the lesson. And it's one of the lessons I talk about in my books. I talk about this in my training, the importance of going into an evergreen market. And so, Tom, I said, what is the, uh, if, if Scrabble Tile Jewelry was around for five minutes, what are the longest, oldest hobbies in America that have been around forever. And uh, what's interesting, I found it was fascinating. The number one or the number two hobby in America for the last 100 plus years has always been the same thing. It's been gardening. Hmm. And I said, gardening is a market that is probably going to be around. It may take a different shape, a different form, but it's probably not something that's going to be disappearing tomorrow. And that led us down this path to go into um, a sub niche within the gardening market and decided to focus on orchids, as in the flower. And, and honestly, the way we kind of came up with that market, I'd sort of brainstorm a big, long list of niches and markets to go into. And uh, the reason why that one made the list is because when we lived in Asia, uh, we bought a bunch of orchids. I bought a bunch of orchids for my wife. And literally a week later, they all died. And I thought, gosh, if we had problems trying to keep our plants alive, we can't be the only people that have this problem. So it kind of led me down this path. And the, the market sort of ticked all the boxes and 
we started a business in that space. And I grew that business from nothing to earning $25,000 a month in about 18 months, grew it to half a million dollars a year, at which point my wife uh, quit her job as a museum curator. We left Brownsville, Texas, moved to Austin, Texas, which is where we've been for the last 10 years or so. And we've since gone into 23 different niche markets, weird niche markets like Orchid Care, and have landed on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing companies in America. And last year just passed uh, $10 million in revenue. And when I first started this business, Tom, my big goal, like my big someday maybe goal, like if I could make this amount of money, I would retire was $10,000 a month. That was my, my big dream when I first started my business. So from $10,000 a month to $10 million a year, um, it's been a, a fun ride and I've learned a lot, made a lot of mistakes along the way. And, um, and that's what I love to talk about is share some of the wisdom and lessons learned. Well, I you know, could very easily have you on and talk about that, the book Ask. I want to just say a quick thing about it because it's not just a strategy that you can understand after two or three sentences. I mean, the, the way you get into the specifics of exactly how to implement it as it's explained in the book is actually very, very helpful. But I, I, I want to just say a quick thing about it. Uh, that, that book sold hundreds of thousands of copies. And it basically is, it's conveying something that we say on this program all the time, that really what is a market economy all about? It's about serving the consumer, right? It's about finding out what consumer preferences are and satisfying those preferences. But sometimes we have this attitude that, well, I want to do this. I, I have this great thing that people ought to like. But that's the wrong way to think about it because it doesn't matter what you like. <laughs> you know, and, and it's not your job to hector people into liking what you're producing. It's your job to figure out what they want and give it to them. And figuring out what they want is trickier than you think. But there are ways to do it. And what your strategy ultimately boils down to, in effect, is just asking them. But it's not a matter of sending them a questionnaire and saying, what, what product would you like? It's, there's more to it than that. But that, that just resonated with me because it's so, in its fundamentals anyway, it's so simple. The execution can be a little bit more involved, but it's, the insight is so important. Well, so then now you've got this other book that's really more fundamental because the book Choose is trying to get you to figure out where do I integrate myself into the division of labor? Where do I integrate myself into the economy? Where is the place where, where I can best serve people? You know, where is that place? And the, the trouble with the ask strategy, it's not the fault of the strategy, is that it, it assumes that you already are in a market. But the, the question that a lot of my folks have is, what market should I enter? How do I choose? I've seen people go into what appear to be pretty good markets where there seem to be interested buyers and whatever, and it just doesn't work for them. They For whatever reason, they just chose badly. And so now it seems to me like this is a natural supplement to your book. Am I at least, am I getting the idea behind the two volumes? You know, this is, this is exactly right. When I, when I wrote Ask, you know, um, I like to tell people business is easy. Figure out what people want and give it to them. That's it. That's all you need to do. Figure out what people want to buy and give it to them. Uh, the problem, as you alluded to, is you can't walk through the front door. You can't just ask people what they want. And so every time I talk about this idea of asking, it alludes people, uh, it elicits uh, uh, quotes like the, the one Henry attributed Ford to Henry one? Ford. Yeah. yeah. And if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have told me faster horses. And, and right, more that's recently, what I thought when I first saw your book. I thought of that exact quote. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I and thought, I don't want to ask these idiots what they want. <laughs> exactly. And so you can't walk through the front door. The questions that you need to ask are somewhat unexpected. They're counterintuitive. People don't know what they want, but they do know what they don't want. For example, if I said, you know, hey, Tom, um, let's grab dinner tomorrow night. What do you feel like eating? Immediately your brain is projecting. You're projecting what you might like, what you might feel like eating. But if I said, all right, Tom, let's just narrow down the list. Let's narrow down the list for a moment. And if there's like one type of food that you just don't like eating, just so we can kind of cross something off the list, what is it that you don't want? And most of us are really good at knowing what that thing is. Like, oh, I don't want to eat. Um, I was reading on, on your, your blog uh, recently. Um, I don't want to go to KFC because <laughs> I was just there, right? Right, um, right. I don't want to, you know, so there's, we're really good at knowing what we don't want. We're also really good at talking about past behavior. If I said, hey, Tom, what'd you have for lunch yesterday? Most of us, unless we have uh, an impaired memory, can say, oh, this is what I had yesterday. So there are questions that we're really good at answering, and there are questions that we're not good at answering. Once you understand what questions to ask, then it allows you to walk down the path of figuring out exactly what it is that people want to buy. My background, like my, my, the thing that held me back from being an entrepreneur 
is that for, for so much of my life, my life was driven by fear, fear of failure, fear of messing up, fear of losing money. So everything that I've done in business has been around risk mitigation. In fact, I mean, I worked in insurance before starting my business. It's all about risk mitigation and extending on that. We talk about ask. Um, when I wrote Ask, what I realized is that there were people out there who fell in love with the methodology, but they said, Ryan, I didn't even know what market I should go into, who I should serve. And it's it's akin to this metaphor that I that I use that I think is really helpful. It's like this. It's like, you know, starting a business is like throwing your canoe in a river. Uh, you can have the best canoe money can buy. You can have the best equipment. You can have the best crew. You can row 18 hours a day and bust your butt in that canoe. But if the canoe is pointed in the wrong direction, or worse yet, the canoe is in a river that has no current, you're never going to get to where you want to go. And that's what I found. The mistake that people were making is they didn't know how to pick the right river. Pick a river that had a current at your back that would propel you forward to where you want to go. I mentioned I've gone into 23 different sort of weird niche markets. And what I didn't teach and ask was the methodology I used to analyze and choose each of those 23 markets. And the methodology that I've now taught literally thousands of my uh, students how to use to start and launch successful businesses. And that's where Choose comes in. It's sort of the prequel to the book Ask. It's the step before you ask, which is not what you're going to create, but who are you going to serve? Who's your market? Who is your who? And that's what the book is all about. And that's the, the process. That's where it all begins. I want to talk about in the same way that you were saying we can find out what people don't want. I, I want to start with the negative, if I may, about mistakes, mistakes people mm. make when they choose which market they're going to enter. Because I, I mean, for example, I think I'm, I think I'm pretty well plugged into this, that a lot of times people will either try to go too big. So they'll, I want to go into diet. Uh, okay. Right. You and 8 million other people, or it's, I want to go into diet for, you know, disabled plumbers in Zaire, you know, like, right, right. that's not going to work. Uh, so, so there's a size thing. And, and also I think people think, well, well, let's start with that one. Uh, that's sure. clearly, that's got to be one of the major issues. It, it's one of the big ones. And if we just extend that sort of boat metaphor, it's sort of like, um, if you have the budget for a canoe, um, number one, you don't want to throw your canoe in a dry riverbed, but you also want to throw your canoe in the middle of the Pacific ocean because you're going to be swallowed up whole you've got to pick the right market for the type of business that you're looking to create. And so um, I have the benefit of a decade of experience and sort of this laboratory of test results to know what are the th certain things that you want to look for. So I was curious, it's easy for us, for you and I to have a conversation and say, you want to pick a market that's the right size. But what does that mean exactly? Like how do you empirically measure what right size market means? And so what I did is I looked back at every single one of the businesses that we had started. And I looked at um, which were most successful and which were least successful. I then extended that same research to uh, extend to include my students. And I looked at my most successful students and my least successful students. And what I found, Tom, was that there's something that uh, we call the market size sweet spot. And if you use a tool called Google Trends, which is a free tool, Google releases this data dating back to 2004 where you can look at the keyword search volume for any term. So you can look at something like Scrabble Tile Jewelry or Orchid Care. You can see how many people around the world or in the United States are searching for that term any given day, any given week, any given month. And what I did is I looked back at every single one of our businesses. And what I found is that every one of our most successful businesses, the search volume, the size in the market, fell within a very narrow band a very narrow band that represented markets that were exactly the right size, not too big, not too small, for bootstrapped entrepreneurs, guys and girls like you and me, who are not raising tens of millions of dollars in venture financing, but are kind of starting a business with our savings, maybe a little bit of borrowed money from friends and family, and doing it ourselves. There's this sweet spot. And if you go into a market that is too big or too small, you're outside that sweet spot and you're setting yourself up for struggle and failure. So the key is finding a market that's within that size. Orchid Care, as an example, just happens to be a market that's right inside that sweet spot. So that's the first mistake, too big or too small from a market standpoint. All right, I wanna take a guess at what the second major mistake is. We'll do that after we take this quick break. Hey everybody, don't you wish you were at the post office right now? 
Well, neither do I, but yet I have to be there all the time because I'm always shipping out books to you people. I like selling books. I just don't like spending all day at the post office. Well, that's why you need stamps.com. Anything you can do at the post office, you can do at stamps.com. Whether you're a small office sending invoices, an online seller shipping out products, or even a warehouse sending thousands of packages a day, stamps.com can handle it all with ease. Simply use your computer to print official U.S. postage 24-7 for any letter, any package, any class of mail, anywhere you want to send. And once your mail's ready, just hand it to your mail carrier, drop it in a mailbox. It's that simple. And you're not just going to save time, you're also going to save money. Because with stamps.com, you can get five cents off every first class stamp and up to 40% off shipping rates. No equipment to lease, no long-term commitments. No wonder over 700,000 small businesses already use Stamps.com. Right now, my listeners get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in Woods. That's Stamps.com. Enter Woods. All right, we're talking about mistakes, and I want to go through this one kind of quickly. To me, again, I've seen this over and over. Sometimes people think if I go into something where there's no competition or very little competition, that's going to be great for me. It's going to be a bonanza, windfall. But what they, and that's possible. I mean, it's not metaphysically an impossibility, but it could be that the reason there's no competition is there's no customers, there's no demand, no one wants the thing. But by contrast, you could also enter uh, an area where you're just overwhelmed with with established competitors with brand name recognition. Uh, you know, is that the best you know expenditure of your energy? You know, it's a great question. And competition is one of these funny things. People usually respond in one of two ways. They come up with an idea, they go online, they look, and either one of two things happens. They look and they say, "Oh my gosh, nobody is doing this. I'm going to get rich." Or they say, oh my gosh, there's like a million people who are already doing this, and then they close the book on the idea and they move on to something else. Now, both of those uh, responses are problematic for two different reasons. The first one is this. If you find someone, if you find an opportunity that nobody is pursuing of the 8 billion-ish people on the planet, you mean to say that you are the first person to have that idea? Chances are no. Chances are more likely that someone else has already had that idea, they've tried to make it work and have failed, and there's no evidence of success. One of my mentors once taught me, he said, remember this, pioneers get shot, settlers get rich. You don't wanna be a pioneer with your face in the dirt and arrows in your back. You don't wanna be the first to market. If you look at the most successful companies of our generation, if you look at Google, if you look at Facebook, if you look at Apple, if you look at any of these companies, Google was not the first search engine, Facebook was not the first social media company, and Apple was not the first to market smartphones or MP3 players. They all found an existing market and built a better mousetrap. So that's the first thing. Second thing is too much competition. Now there is such a thing as too much competition. You don't wanna to toss your boat in the middle of a red ocean where uh, you are competing in a, a sea of overwhelming competition. Um, but much like market size, there is a sweet spot. The sweet spot is just the right amount of competition. Not too many competitors, but not too few either. You wanna be right there in the middle. And that's what you're looking for. You're looking for a market that's the right size, the right amount of demand in terms of people searching to solve that specific problem, and the right amount of supply, the right amount of competition. So the market's already been blazed for you. You're not a pioneer, you're a settler, but again, you're not in a crowded or overcrowded market where you're gonna be eaten alive. And when you find the market that falls in both of those sweet spots, it's what we call a green light market. And that's where everything begins and that's where everything becomes interesting. And that's what I'm always looking for is what are the green light markets? What is a green light market that's worth pursuing? Um, and that's the first step in the process. All right, now I wanna get into the positive analysis here. Sure. You've got a section on a five market must have. So you're trying to figure out what's what should I do? What should I look for? What should I yep. enter? And you've got five of them. So let's let's try and go through like in a lightning round, what are the five? So uh, five market must-haves. I alluded to one earlier. Number one, you want an evergreen market. That means a market that's here to stay. A market like Orchid Care, it's gonna be around for the next decade or 100 years. Not a market like Scrabble Tile Jewelry that's gonna be here today, gone tomorrow. It's the first thing. Second thing is you want what's called an enthusiast market. And your market, Tom, is a perfect example of this. An enthusiast market is a market where people remain consumers in that market 
for months and often years and years and years, as opposed to a problem solution market where people are a consumer in that market for a very brief amount of time and then move on. An example of that would be something like wart removal or flooded basement. You have a flooded basement, you solve that problem, you move on with your life. You're not gonna be a listener of the flooded basement podcast or the wart removal blog. You're gonna move on with your life. So you want what's called an enthusiast market. That's number two. Number three, it's not enough to be in an evergreen enthusiast market. You also need to solve an urgent problem in the context of that enthusiast market. In the orchid care space, an urgent problem is uh, a woman wakes up, walks downstairs from her bedroom, goes to the kitchen, finds the orchid on her kitchen table, and all the blooms have suddenly fallen off overnight. The plant was healthy the night before, she wakes up the next morning and the plant looks like it's dead. She rushes to Google to see what did she do, how did she kill this plant that maybe her son gave to her for Mother's Day, and she's desperate to find a solution. That's an urgent problem. That's number three. Number four is future problems. You want a market where once you solve the first problem in that person's life, it leads to the need to solve the next problem. For example, uh, the dog market is a perfect example. You train your dog to, to sit and come when it's called, that's great, but now the dog has a barking problem. So that's the next problem that you need to solve. Or maybe the dog needs to be potty trained so it learns to go to the bathroom outside. Or maybe the dog has a biting problem. So each solution leads to the need to solve the next problem down the road. The fifth and final market must-haves is to be in a market filled with what we call PWMs or players with money. And what that means is you can't sell to broke people. You can't sell to people who don't have the ability to put a roof over their head and food on the table. You have to sell to a market that has disposable income to invest in that part of their life. So five market must-haves, evergreen number one, enthusiast number two, urgent problem number three, future problems number four, and players with money number five. All right. So when you wrote Ask, you were writing in terms of people who, you know, were established in something and they just wanted to be better at the something. They wanted to serve people better and frankly, make more money, which is Mm -hmm. what serving people better gets for you. You know, you get, you give people what they want, you know, you're going to get what you want. The old Zig Ziglar thing. Exactly. So choose though, as given that we're taking a step back, is the idea here that there's no, it's not like you have to have an, you know, an MBA or something to follow this, right? The idea is that these are, after years of observing people doing this, these are some good distilled principles that you ought to follow if you want to, let's say, just do your own thing or start a business or, you know, whatever it is. Absolutely. You do not, you don't need an MBA. I don't have an MBA. Um, I, Um, I don't have an advanced degree. I didn't study business. I didn't study finance. My background is in East Asian studies and uh, incidentally neuroscience. So I studied, uh, I was pre-med and uh, I was studying uh, humanities. So I have have no background in finance, no background in economics, no background in business when I started my first business. And this is a process that um, is one that anybody can use if you want to build an income online, meaning you want to start a side hustle or a side income, a part-time thing, a full-time thing, and do what I did, go all in and quit your job. Um, I have students of mine who have made their first dollar ever using this process. I have students who have built and grown their income from nothing to $10,000 a month, $25,000 a month, a million dollars a year or more. And it's not to say that those results are typical of everyone who goes through the process. It's just to kind of walk you through what is possible um, when you follow this. And again, if you're the type of person that likes to avoid uh, failing, which I am, um, I was afraid to lose money when I started my business. And I wanted a process I could follow that would kind of give me a green light and say, this is something you can move forward on. Nope, you need to turn around and start over again before wasting time, money, effort, and energy going down a path that was destined to fail in the first place. And so if that's the type of thing that resonates with you, then I think this process will um, uh, be very much something that you'll uh, appreciate and will be helpful. All right. So as I said about your books, what I like about them, the reason that I would want to have you on is that they are not just X number of pages of fluff, which is so frustrating. People don't have time for that. They want to know what exactly am I supposed to do, or at least what are the principles I should be using in order to assess different options that are in front of me? 
And you basically, it seems to me, based on the, the feedback you get, and by the way, I've seen a number of your Facebook ads and I look at the comments. Now, people in the comments of Facebook ads can be really nasty because <laughs> for some reason, if you are selling something to people, they get angry at you. I don't know why that is. I mean, if you don't want something, don't buy it. You know, why are you angry? Like, and I, I just think these are the people, the last people in the world I ever want to deal with, you know, who are so angry that they, like I, Jersey Mike's sub sandwiches, they'll be angry that their sandwiches are too expensive and they complain on the ad. I mean, just shut up, go about your life, you know? But in your Facebook ads, everybody's saying, I love this guy's books, he's awesome, and you should listen to everything he said. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, you know, somehow you have people who like you in Facebook ads. But anyway, so every year, uh, my understanding is you do a live thing where you actually run through the process so that people can actually see it they can see case studies of exactly how somebody takes these and really implements them. You really put flesh and blood on them, basically. So that is coming up, I think, within the next few weeks sometime. Yeah, we um, once a year, we do this thing that we call the Ask Method Workshop. And basically, it's, it's totally free. And it's the thing I do once a year. I've done it for the last couple of years. And what I do is I take people through this process step by step. Anybody can participate. I do it live and I go through the process step by step. And the reason why I do that is, um, number one, I think it's real. I'm the type of person that likes to kind of go through something in a short amount of time to really understand it um, and then execute on it. I also, to your point, uh, bring on a bunch of my past students who, who have used this process and they share their experience and then they you know, sort of take you behind the scenes of their business in all sorts of different markets, childhood education, business consulting, obscure markets like beekeeping and orchid care, uh, weight loss, financial markets. I mean, we could go on and on. And I do this once a year and it's just coming up around the corner. And so for anyone who's interested in kind of diving deeper in this um, in a little bit more detail, your timing is perfect. And um, I'd love to have you part of this free workshop. All right. So what I will do is whatever the link is to sign up to it probably has a million characters in it. So what my folks are accustomed to hearing whenever it's, and whatever, whether it's razors or a book or whatever, the link is always tomwoods.com slash blah, blah, blah. So in this case, I'll set up tomwoods.com slash ask because that's nice and Perfect. brief and easy for people to remember tomwoods.com slash ask and really should, should go do it because there's, there's going to be some good actionable content in it. And this could be just the kick in the pants that you need. And it's a tried and true method. And everybody raves about Ryan. And uh, I mean, even Ben Settle, who, <laughs> let's just say, Ben does not rave about a lot of people, all right? That is not, <laughs> Ben is a very crotchety person whom I've had on my podcast several times, who has made my life much, much better, as I said. But uh, his endorsement really, really carries a lot of weight with me. And I hope with my folks as well. So tomwoods.com slash ask, you should go and, and uh, check that out for sure. And then come back and report your success story to me because I want to build up an army of successful Tom Wood Show listeners um, in this uh, difficult world uh, we live in today. So Ryan, thanks so much for your time today. Any uh, parting words for the folks before we call it a day? You know, I'll share one piece of advice that uh, one of my mentors passed along to me. It's sort of been my, my rally cry and my mantra throughout my entire career as an entrepreneur, and it's this. Remember, you don't have to get it perfect. You just have to get it going. But the best time to get it going is right here, right now, today. So go out there and change the world. I'll, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to that. The best thing I ever did was start this podcast uh, six and a half years ago now. By far the best thing I ever did in terms of doing something I enjoy that also supports me comfortably. It's by far the best thing. And I delayed and delayed and delayed because it was never precisely the right time. But the problem is your life's going to pass you by because that precisely right time will never come. It'll always be something. So go to this thing. I mean, I'm telling you, if I had started this podcast three years earlier, my life would be much different. And look, I'm not complaining. I have a great life, <laughs> but it would have been a lot better and a lot easier if I had, if I had just said, doggone it, what I'm really doing is making excuses. You know, I'll find the time one way or another, but now is, now is that time. So tomwoods.com slash ask is where I'll, I'll get you guys over to sign up for this. And Ryan, thanks again. Thanks so much, Tom. All right, folks, I strongly urge you to check that out. As I say, I've made it easier for you to get there by just doing tomwoods.com slash ask. 
uh, so you can get to that uh, registration page more easily. Next week, it's Bob Murphy week on the Tom Wood Show. If you don't know Bob Murphy, oh my goodness, are you really a Tom Wood Show listener? He's my co-host on the Contra Krugman podcast and the co-host with me of the Contra Cruise. He is an outstanding economist and libertarian theorist, very prolific, very smart, very sharp, and it's going to be a lot of fun to talk to him about some tricky topics next week. So make sure you subscribe to The Tom Woods Show over at tomwoods.com slash apple, and I'll see you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.